I really gotta get some theme music. This is uh, this is getting too bland. But anyway, uh, so let's just pretend that I have a rad intro song going on right now. Welcome to Virtual Workshop. It's our weekly live event where we're gonna be building DIY electronics. Uh, so this week we're doing one with uh, with the Teensy 3.1, which acts natively as a USB keyboard or mouse or there's another one that you can do as well. I forget what it is. But we'll find out in a minute because it's in the tutorial. Anyway, um, so we've got a couple of announcements for you first. Uh, we've got a new challenge running with the link at one. Um, so if you enter this, it's a smart cities challenge. I'll show you that page right now. And you can win a link at one or all kinds of other stuff. So let's see, that's not the right page. <laughs> But anyway, if you go to hackster.io and then click this link right here, or go to challenges at any time, uh, you'll see a list of what we've got going on right now. We just wrapped up the smartphone hacks challenge with OneShield and the Windows 10 IoT core challenge. We'll announce those winners soon. But anyway, this one just started on Friday before our hackathon over the weekend, which is where I built this keyboard for the first time. And um, it's its goal is to help us build the next generation of cities. It's only a little bit more than a week long, so be sure to put your uh, entry in now. But as you can see, you can win a new iPad Pro, a new iPad Mini, or the new Apple TV. All this awesome stuff, plus DIY tech like the Seed Studio, um, discounts and things. Besides that, we want to share with you this thing that our friends at Intel are doing. Um, it's a reality show where you can compete to be America's greatest maker or maker team. Uh, you'll get a budget for building whatever you want. All you have to do is propose something to build with the Intel Curie module, which is their next generation after the Edison. It's tinier and it has a little bit less like oomph, but it's got way more in terms of embeddability and wearables and things like that. Uh, Let's just look up a picture of it because it's extremely tiny. Intel Curie. It's that big. Isn't that insane? Anyway, um, let's go back to the tutorial. So we're going to be building a USB keyboard. This is the example that I'm following from um, uh, Paul Stoffergen's website, uh, which is for the, he's the maker of the TNC, and they have some pretty cool tutorials over here like using it as a oh, joystick. That was the other thing. OK, so you can set it up as a keyboard, a mouse, or a joystick. Or it's also very versatile in terms of setting up um, audio processing. So if you're doing anything with MIDI, with custom controllers, with synthesizers, you should definitely pick one of these up because they're tiny, they're pretty inexpensive, and they're super powerful. So to get started, um, Obviously, we're going to be putting some buttons on this. Let's start with the coding, though. Uh, in order to program the Teensy, you can program it like an Arduino, but you have to set up your environment first. So you'll be going, um, let's see, Teensy Arduino. This is how you go about it. Um, download Teensy Arduino, whatever is appropriate for your platform. And then it'll be basically a custom version uh, of something that plugs into Arduino. Um, so you will see how this works later on. But basically, you install this. And then when you're running the Teensy version of Arduino, you'll get an extra little pop-up that shows that it's interacting with the Teensy. Uh, let's see, when you upload. So I've got that set up. In fact, I'm going to launch it now. Ooh, Arduino TNC, there's my custom version. And probably we're going to see pop up the code that I wrote over the weekend. I built this in about three hours on a challenge from one of our attendees. But I've got some other stuff open here. You can have a, you know, a quick sneak peek at that if you want. In the meantime, <clears throat> what we're going to do is open up a new sketch. And you see how you've got your standard Arduino set up here, a setup 
uh, section where it runs once and you set up your pins and things, and then a loop section which is going to repeat over and over and over and over again as long as the Arduino is powered on. So this is the first example that I was basically adapting in order to build my binary keyboard. Um, so let's just pull it in here, and we'll go through it. I'm going to add a little bit of extra stuff here. Okay. And save it as, let's see, TNC tutorial. Fantastic. As you can see, I've got way too many sketches going on. But um, so we start with uh, the way this works is it's simply, let's see, it prints hello world to your computer as long as the TNC is plugged in. And then it increments a counter by one each time. So basically, it'll print hello world zero, hello world one, hello world two, hello world three, et cetera. You get the point. Um, and so that's a good thing to keep in mind here, is that it will run as soon as the TNC reboots after you've uploaded the code, which means that if you hit upload and you still have this sketch open, then right here or wherever the cursor is, it's going to start printing, hello world, hello world, hello <laughs> world. As I found out, that's really annoying because it's modifying the exact code that you're trying to load onto it. So it's like some cyborg evil thing from the future. Uh, only it, the you know your terrifying cyborg future is now. But anyway, <laughs> let's get to modifying this. So I've got a big green button here. I'm going to show you what we're going to be working with. Uh, stop. Present it. No. There we go. <laughs> Super close up. Yeah, I've got a big green button. This comes from Sparkfun. It's a. Uh, it's called something like big green button or big red button, you know, but you can get it in green too. Uh, it's, it's 100 millimeters across, I think, 10 centimeters. That looks about right. It makes a great noise. It's even got, let's see if I can pull this apart for you. So it snaps together and oops, there we go. And it's got an LED in it too, so if you hook up that, the power to that, then the whole button lights up. And that can be controlled as well because it's got a contact. Where is the contact? There it is, um, for powering the LED. Uh, so you can set that up if you like. We're not going to use that right now. But it snaps together like that. Um, the thing itself, you can see, has a sort of screw connection. Uh, this thing comes off. And you can attach it to whatever base you like. This is one that I printed during my artist residency at Autodesk here in nine um, for a different. Oh dear, <laughs> my wire came off. Well, we'll just pretend that that didn't happen, and I'll solder it back on later. Okay. That's why you try to be gentle with your electronics. But yeah, big green button. <laughs> we may or may not be able to get this to work now, but we'll try. You know what? We'll try. Because we don't have to have a solder connection. I'm going to fix this real quick. I should have something sharp in here somewhere. In which case, you can sort of strip this wire a bunch of, oh, on both ends. <laughs> don't, don't do it this way at home. This is not the best way. I know it's a tutorial, but I'm using a USB cable to strip this. It's no good. <laughs> Don't do this, please. Um, what I'm going to basically do is restrip this and since this end is not breadboard friendly, it's got this little hook on it, I'm going to wrap it around the contact on the button. <laughs> Super pro. Really, though, if you're a hardware hacker, I mean, you've got to be able to improvise. This is what I tell myself at night. OK. It'll work. You'll see. And now I'm just wrapping this around the contact on there. It shouldn't have come off of it in the first place. Later on, we'll find out whether or not my little hack was successful. 
Okay. So I wrap it up around it another time or two just to stabilize it. <laughs> Apologies to Spark Fun. I know I'm abusing your goods. So then on the other hand, we have the Teensy. Um, I'll pull up the pin out for you in a minute so you can see it a little better. But we're going to be using um, the ground pin over here. And over here are our digital pins. So I'm going to start with pin two, just because that's popular. There's another ground pin over here in the middle. And so what we're going to do is hook up. Uh, we're going to plug in the USB over here. We're going to hook up the button to D2 and to ground. Now, each of these digital pins has a pull up. So that means that it's not going to float in the middle when it's not connected. It's never going to be like. Uh, half voltage or something. If you configure it as an input using the pull-up resistor, it will always be held high unless you connect it to ground, and that's how we're going to tell that the button has been pushed. In fact, you can do that with some jumper wires. I'm going to show you that first. Um, but let's get back to program. that uses, oh dear, hopefully you're not getting distortion. So this, this newer version of the TNC Oh dear, we've got the TNC pin out. This is usually what I do for pinouts. I just look up all the versions and try to find what what's high res. It works out. Here we go. So we're going to be using this ground pin here and pin D2. Let's go back to Arduino. We need to add a constant integer variable, which is basically this number is going to always stay the same. And that's because we're using, we're defining pin D2. So let's see, button pin equals two. And that basically says this number is always going to stay the same. The button is going to be on digital pin two. It says, um, as an input using the pull-up resistor. So that means that we have to go, let's see, how is exactly the syntax? It doesn't hurt to keep looking this stuff up and refreshing your memory because, uh, you know, if you're working with a bunch of different languages, you'll have to refresh every once in a while. And it'll save your, you know, save you a lot of time if you just look at it first without trying four different things first, <laughs> which is also fun. So it turns out that first we actually have to create a variable for the button state, which is what we're going to be checking every time we look at this. So every time we run the program, every time it goes through its loop, it's going to check to see whether the button is pressed or not. So let's say button state equals, oh, it's an integer, but it changes so it's not constant, equals zero. Because right now, the button is not pressed, and it's not going to be when we start the program. We don't want it to think that. So during our setup phase, we're going to set up this pin as an input using the pull-up resistor. So pin mode, button pin, input pull-up. In this case, I've got five buttons and a haptic motor, but we're not going to use that right now. So we're going to say, I'm going to add something around this. We're going to run this basic program, but I'm going to add something that checks first to see whether the button is pushed so that we don't get a bunch of random hello worlds in our program here. So if, let's see, um, state, wait, I think we have to say, if it's low, right? 
Yeah, so read button state. The first thing we're doing here is checking to see whether the pin is high or low. And now we say if the button state is low, then we're going to do this. So with this guy, first we're doing this. Um, we're checking to see if it's low. And the reason we use two equal signs is because one equal sign means that you're setting the variable to a specific value. So for example, we're setting button state here, which was 0 with whatever the output come is when we check this pin to see if the button was pressed. And now we're saying, if it's low, whereas if we just said button state equals low, then we would be saying, oh, tell me that the button is low uh, instead of checking. OK, so if it's low, then do this stuff, um, and then wait for uh, five seconds. And we're going to, let's turn that down to half a second. In fact, yeah, half a second is good. That way it debounces, which means that uh, if you, it won't read twice. It won't read two button presses if it loops around while you're still holding the button down. You should be able to press and release the button in half a second. Otherwise, you might want to work on your reflexes. But so here we've got this. And <laughs> I haven't reviewed this code today to try and keep it like a fresh experience for you. So we're going to see if this works for now. Grab the USB cable that I was abusing earlier. For newcomers, it's because I used it to strip another wire. And I'm going to. Um, I'm going to plug this in, as it were, to a breadboard. It doesn't have any headers on it, but I think that I can make it work. But, so let's see. Pin, the ground pin is here, and the two pin is four in. OK. So ground pin there. Let's see if I can just sort of pin this guy down. And then we've got the ground pin and the button pin from this. And then let's lean this down a little bit. I'm sorry if you get some uh, some noise from that. There we go. So I'm plugging this black ground wire. First, I'm reconnecting it to the button. And now I'm going to plug it into the breadboard with that ground pin. And then this is going to go into pin two. Which is right there. Fantastic. And now I can just sort of set this button on top. <laughs> and okay, I need to plug it in by USB as well. It's a little fiddly. I wish I had longer wires on here. So USB cable. I believe this has nothing loaded on it right now except the blink sketch. All right, so here's our button. I'm going to pull it back up here. You can see it blinking. Awesome. So if you have a smaller breadboard, this has a hole in the side for the USB cable, and you'd be able to just use this whole thing as a unit.
Let's go back to screen sharing and I'll show you the upload process. So we've got this loaded into Arduino TNC. We're going to hit upload. And I might need to hit the programming button on the TNC itself. Yep. OK, there we are. So you see this thing popped up, which is the TNC window. And that shows you that if you haven't pushed the program button to enter program mode, you need to do that. Now, this should be working as a keyboard. So I'm going to hit it. Oh, yeah, awesome. It seems like our connection is a little weak, but that's kind of understandable. Fantastic. Check it out. Oh, no. Hmm. No, that should be pretty decent. Let's try it again. Oh, yeah. That delay might be a little long. OK. But anyway, as you can see, that works. Fantastic. Now I'll take you through the logic of the binary keyboard that I made uh, on Sunday over the weekend. I know, it was Saturday night. Let me tell you about these hackathons. These hackathons can get pretty crazy. We just wrapped up our final uh, Hardware Weekend hackathon of the year. So we did 12 hackathons in 12 cities in six months, uh, like New York, Phoenix, Seattle, Louisville. Our last one was in Washington, DC, San Francisco. So we were in DC. And I was, it was Saturday night, which is often the lull period, because it's a two-day hackathon. And a lot of people have gone home to sleep. And to keep myself awake, I decided to mess around with the TNC because I've never used it before. And I've always been interested in building my own keyboard. Uh, so I started putting this thing together. And then this guy, Daniel, comes by. And he's like, oh, you can't get that working. I'll, I'll make a Twitter account and send my first tweet if you can write my name with that. And then he was like, and I was like, yeah, OK, I'll do it. I can totally do that. And then he was like, in one hour. And I was like, oh, no. So I got it working in 70 minutes. Um, and what it is is horrendous because it was so fast. But I've got this soft thumb button and then these four finger buttons. So basically, I took apart this breadboard. I used to have these power and ground rails on the side, like you see here. Um, this is basically the exact same type of keyboard, only these snap on. And they've got these little nubbins on the side, which I removed for comfort. And uh, so each, each finger has its own little button. And then the thumb has this one that you push with the side. So it's a comfortable grip. And this is the ones place. So you can count on your fingers in binary. Uh, four is what you say when someone is being rude. So you've got, you start with zero, then you've got the ones place twos, fours, eights, and sixteens. And with those numbers, like if you have a one for all of them, that's one sixteen plus one eight plus one four plus one two plus one one, then you get 31. And that's the number of total possible combinations you can have. Which is cool, because that's five more than the standard English alphabet. So you would get like one, two, so that's one, one, zero, one is one, two, and zero, one. Three, so one, two, and one, one. Four, five, six, seven, because it's a four, a two, and a one. Eight, which is kind of tough to do. But anyway, you got the picture. So going alphabetically, this is going to be A, just the thumb button. B is going to be just the index finger button. C is both of those. It's a little awkward yet. It could definitely be more ergonomic. Yeah, that's the logic of this thing. And it's checking for that, I believe, still every half a second, because I want it to be able to debounce. And then if you're not pushing any buttons, then it doesn't type anything. This is a little bit janky, because I was soldering on top of a breadboard. So as you can see, there's some singeing. And I use this ground wire that doesn't solder very well, because it's a lot of strands twisted together which means that it is a high uh, heat resistance. So it doesn't heat up easily. It doesn't take solder easily. And it's basically the worst thing. But <laughs> this thing ended up working, so that's pretty good. In the meantime, on the back, you see the TNC hooked up. 
as a living. In the meantime, you've got this haptic motor. Because I wanted to be able to operate this without looking at it and without looking at anything so that I could just know when to type, uh, you have to have an indicator to help you keep the rhythm. Because otherwise, you'll get off and you'll start hitting the buttons when it's reading or pausing instead of when it's, uh, when it's supposed to be active. And so this haptic motor vibrates. You've got a half second to type and then a half second pause. So the haptic motor starts vibrating a quarter second in, and then you're supposed, and then it reads, and then a quarter second later the motor stops vibrating, and then you have a half second to rest, and then it vibrates for a quarter second, reads, vibrates for another quarter second, and then stops for a half second. It works really well, but it also kind of deadens deadens the nerves in your hand. So after you use this, you kind of end up being like, oh, tingly. It's not very pleasant. And so we've got to figure out something better. Probably just adjust the amount of time that it takes, that it vibrates. In fact, let's do that right now. I'm going to modify my sketch. Bring it up here. Oh, dear. So there's our existing one that we just made. And as you see, it works. Of course, I can take this out and save it. OK. Because you don't want to be, <laughs> you don't want to be sticking random stuff in your sketch unless you've got, you know, you could have a little practice area here commented out. Practice area. I can't type today. And then you would end it that way. So that's your little commented out section. I'm going to stick that at the bottom of this sketch too, so I don't have to open up a new document. And we're going to change this to. It's going to vibrate. So here, we set up the haptic pin, right? All the buttons are set up as usual, pins two through six. The haptic pin is on seven. And that doesn't need its own variable yet, because you're just going to be turning it off and on. But you do need to set it as an output. I've also added a couple of extra variables here. Binary is the value that we're going to be printing based on what I, what buttons I pushed. So that's the actual typing that happens. And then you've got this thing to tell you whether or not any buttons were pushed. So if you didn't, it's like before here. We said, you know, if the button's been pressed, then type hello world. And otherwise, don't do anything, because otherwise you end up with a bunch of trash in your sketch. In this case, we've got a bunch of different buttons, so I just use one variable to say, you know, if I'm going to print, set that to one. Otherwise, uh, just keep it at zero, and then we won't do anything at the end of reading. So set up the haptic pin as an output. Set both of these to zero. So clear out whatever we'd written before. And by default, don't print anything. So here's where we start vibrating the motor. And it goes for a quarter of a second here. Now we do all the reading of the different pins. And then we check. So if the thumb state is 1, this is my very simple decimal to binary converter. Or actually, it's not even a converter. It's just, it's just a binary code generator. So remember how we said that the thumb stands for the 1's place. The index finger stands for the 2's place. The middle finger stands for the 4's place. The ring finger for 8's and pinky for 16s. Well, the easy way to turn this into a code is to simply say, OK, take decimal 0 and add, you know, just pretend like it's decimal numbers. So we read this as 10. And that's what the sketch thinks it is as well. It thinks that this, if we had all of these active, it would equal 11,111. <laughs> However, what it really means is 31. But the program doesn't have to know that. So basically, we're just turning it into something that visually looks like binary, because I want to learn binary. In fact, I've got a, a binary face on my Pebble watch right now. I'll show you in a minute. But anyway, so if any of these is high or is low, add its value to the total binary output. And these are never going to conflict, 
because each one is only modifying one digit and they're all adding together. And then tell us to print at the end. And finally, again with the double equals sign, we're not setting this value, we're checking it. Um, then print the output. Wait for a quarter second. This is where I'm going to take this out. And very vitally, only the printing part is based on the, the variable do print. So basically, now I'm going to, I've taken out the other quarter second of vibration, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait for three quarters of a second. And that way we'll get less vibration and hopefully less unpleasantness. So now, I've unplugged that TNC. I'm just going to use this to type something. But I'll show you real life. OK. So yeah, here's the binary watch face. Basically, the top, the top row is um, hours, then it's minutes and seconds. And this has six places, which means that you also have the 32s place, which means this is 64s because that's 2 to the 0. Anything to the 0 is 1. 2 to the 1, so 2 times 1 is, or just 2, 1, 2, is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 to the third power, so 2 times 2 times 2, is 8. 2 cubed. 2 to the fourth is 16, etc. 32, 64. Which means that with these fingers, the highest we can get is 63. Uh, it's one less than the next finger over. So if we've got six, then we can do it. Let's see. How do we do this? Okay. So <laughs> we'll do it this way. Um, well, what's the time right now? We've got these two fingers up, which means that that's a four and an eight, which means that it's about 12. And then we've got a the second finger up, which means that it's 02, 1202. And we've got the, which thumb? I was using this one. <laughs> this is 32. We've got a 16. And then right now, we've got a 4. So 32 plus 16 plus 4, that's 20. So it's 52, 52 seconds. 1202 and 52 seconds, right when I looked at the seconds hand. Um, now, oh yeah, we're going to use this to write some stuff. And then I'm going to check out this other new board called the IMU Duino, which is a Leonardo-based, or a Leonardo analog, made by this group called Femto Duino. They make the tiniest boards that you've ever seen. The tiniest boards that run Arduino that uh, are standard types. So this is a Leonardo plus Bluetooth low energy. And I think they've got a new version of that out, but I'll tell you about it later. You can look that up. But for now, let's make some weird stuff happen. Oof. So that's really unpleasant. I don't know if you can hear, but it's going for half a second at a time. Now we're going to upload it with the new sketch that we just did that vibrates for only a quarter of a second each time. That seems way better. And the nice thing is that since this is a physical motor, it takes a little time to spin up and down as well. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little bit more comfortable. That's way better. OK, so now let's go back to the screen share and look at what we're going to type in the sketch. Go away, you. OK, bring it forward to again. So we've got a practice area here. I don't have that many letters memorized, but let's see. Um, if I wanted to type dad, those are all really small numbers. So D is the fourth letter of the alphabet, which means we're going to push the middle finger. Sweet. So as you can see, it's binary four. And then A is one, push the thumb. And then on beat with the, the haptic cue, I'm going to push the four again. So we get dad. Fantastic. Now let's see, Y would be 25. We could type daddy, or like, I don't know, type something else. How about mm, horse? 
<laughs> That's a challenge. Oh man, how do you? Let's see, converting horse to binary. Oh man, let's see. You know what? We'll do it right here. Okay, so H O R S E. So then H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. O is. Mm, N is 14, O is 15. O P Q R, so that's going to be 18. S is the next one. Okay, this isn't so bad. And then E is 5. Cool. Um, so changing this to binary, it's going to be 8, 4, 2, 1. 15 is going to be because it's right before 16. Um, so 18 is going to be 16 plus 2, or 18 is going to be that. 19 is going to be one more than that. I'll check this later, but I think it's correct. And then 5 is going to be 101. Let's see, 8, 15, 18. If I want it to be fancy, I could splice zeros in here so that it was a little bit easier to read, like that. But I'm not going to do that because I'm lazy. Also, I think it makes it a little bit tougher to read. And as I said, I want to learn the binary. So we're going to type this now. So I'm going to use, uh, let's stop screen sharing for a second. And I'll show you how it works. So 10000 zero, 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 zero is the ring finger. And then these four are going to be pressed for ones. This is always a little bit of a pain. Urgh. Oh, no, I didn't do it. If we do it with two hands, I'm going to cheat. Cool. And then 10010 zero, zero, one, zero is going to be pinky and index fingers. Oh, no. One of them is going to press. There we go. 10011. Zero, zero, one, one. This is very difficult. No. I'm cheating. There we go. And then 101. That should be easy. There we go. OK, now I'll show you the output. <laughs> I wasn't looking at the screen during this. I'm sure it was, oh, no. OK. I'm sure it looks terrible. Uh, but anyway, so here we go. Arduino, fantastic. So that's the four there. Four, or sorry, the eight for H. Oh, RSE. And this was my attempt when I was uh, using both hands and things. It's a little bit, it's not perfect. So with the next iteration of this board, um, and with a little bit more practice, we should be able to get it faster and have it look prettier in the end. But at least for now, that's how you're going to build your very own USB keyboard. And it can be, as in this case, anything you want. It can be binary. It could be something that outputs musical notes. It could be something that does really anything that you want to print. As you saw here, it, uh, it can be printing an entire phrase when you hit a button. Anything you like. So now, let's see. I'm going to try hooking up this Leonardo. And I'm going to guess it isn't programmed the same way as the Teensy. Oh, one special thing to note with this is that you're going to be setting up the Teensy specifically as a keyboard, mouse, or joystick. So that's something that you're going to have to select under Tools and USB Type. And make sure, of course, that you have Teensy 3.1 selected if that's the board that you have. This doesn't really affect us, the keyboard layout, because I'm pretty sure that that only counts if you have it set up as an actual default keyboard. Like, for example, we can map these buttons to anything we like. However, if you had a standard keyboard, you'd have to, to set it up in a standard way. OK. So we've got this Leonardo here. I'm going to see how we program that. But first, here is the tutorial that I wrote on creating this keyboard. You can see everything, all the code samples and everything down here. It's on GitHub. 
the fritzing diagram for hooking it up. Please don't do it the same way I didn't just hot glue everything to a breadboard. Uh, the actual fritzing diagram and all the, the materials that you'll need, plus the whole gruesome story. For now, let's see. I am you know, BTLE. Oh, look, there's a GitHub repo for it. Oh, OK. <laughs> cool. cool. I'm going to assume that this takes. Um, I forget what I was going to say. No, this works with standard Arduino, and it does. So I don't want to work with Android. So I don't have to deal with any of the Cordova stuff. Let's just look at straight at the Arduino libraries. Hopefully there's going to be examples. I mean, do we know? Looks promising. Ooh, examples for the accelerometer. And it looks like this is still uh, quite recently updated, so it's a living repository. Let's start it. Just so we get updated with this stuff. Okay, so let's see, a calibration. I don't necessarily want to deal with this stuff right now because although, so this, that's the other special thing about this is that it works as a keyboard or mouse. It's also got Bluetooth low energy built in, like we said, and it also has an IMU, as the name suggests. It, has, it can detect you know, its movement through space. And let's see, what all does it have? Oh, it's in here. Features. So nine slash ten degrees of motion slash degrees degrees of freedom. <laughs> Pardon. It. That means that it probably has an accelerometer. Oh, here we go. Yeah, a gyroscope, accelerometer, an altimeter. That's right. They've got something in here that tells you the air pressure so it can sense its altitude. Um, it would be great for skydivers or someone building drones to be able to control something remotely. That's pretty fantastic. Uh, and then it's got, yeah, it can, it can tell its position. Gyroscope means um, it can tell, I think, pitch and yaw. Accelerometer, it can definitely tell, tell which way is up. And then it's got a three-axis digital compass or magnetometer which is, it can sense its cardinal direction. So let's see. Yeah, gyro and accelerometer basically work together to tell you uh, its roll pitch and yaw. So let's have a look at these libraries we've got and examples. I'd like to find something that lets let it just work as a keyboard, but maybe we can use this example to make it type something when it when it reaches a certain point. Let's see. We don't necessarily need the Bluetooth part of this right now. I just want it to work with USB. Let's see. Oh, cool. Inertial keyboard and inertial mouse. Fantastic. So first we're going to have to install the library. Um, so let's just go clone this. <laughs> IRC. Let's see. Changing into the place where I keep all my Git repos. Oh, cool. I've already played around with this a little, I guess, but it was a long time ago. So let's change there and say git pull to get all the newest updates. Merge conflict, no! I'm just going to go delete the old version because I'm pretty sure it's way out of date. Let's see. This would be a lot easier <laughs> if it were alphabetized. There we go. Oops. Hmm. 
<laughs> now that's in the trash. Okay. No, let's go back to our regular place. Okay, good. Clone. Gotta keep track of where you are. There we go. And it's back. Now it's new. We should start to see things appearing in there. There we are. Okay. So Arduino libraries. I'm gonna open my libraries folder, which is under documents, Arduino libraries. And if anything already exists in here, I'm just gonna overwrite it. So let's just drag this stuff in. Please. Fantastic. Oh, I probably should have copied instead of moving. So let's actually undo that. Now I'm going to have to restart Arduino so I can find this. And I'm just going to look at the examples through here. Let's see, we were looking at the, which was the library, those examples we were checking out. I think it was this one. Are you doing a, no, didn't want that one. There we go. Inertial keyboard, that's the money. <laughs> So we've got all these libraries now, including the debug. Oh, cool. So it's got debug info built in. The all pitch roll. OK, so it's reading a bunch of stuff. Here we're reading the values. Scale angles to mass movements. I'm assuming he means keyboard. In this case, awesome. That's pretty rad. Oh, so this is just gonna. Oh, cool. This is just a movement thing. So it's using this as a motion controller. Whether it's um, oh, you know what? I might not want to be in the Teensy version of Arduino anymore. So let's just launch the original version. And often it'll open up the same sketch as that you had open before. Yeah, here we go. So whether you're using this for the mouse or the keyboard, it's just using it for motion. So let's see what happens if I've never done this before. Let's just try uploading this. Oh, ever error compiling. You know what? Oh, okay, so it can't find that library specifically. Let's find out. ADXL345.h. Well, I don't blame it. It doesn't seem to be in there. It's possible that's from an earlier version of the repo that included that. Oh, no. OK, well, that just means that we'll have to find that. ADXL345. Well, Oh, and that's the accelerometer chip that they're using. Cool. I don't need sample code. I need the library. So let's go back. Library. There we go. Oh, wait. Was it one of those ones that starts out with? No. OK. It's not in there. So let's clone this and do the same thing as before with our other libraries. Do, do, do. I'm in Git, it's still cool. Awesome. Go to Finder. That would be in Git. It. Here we go. And that's the library folder itself. So I'm just going to copy that and throw it in there. 
restart Arduino because we had a new library. There was something else I wanted to tell you, but I forget what it was. So let's see, upload. Oh no, it should be in there though. So 345.h. Uh, it's got a U on it. It's written differently. Okay. Hopefully this is a compatible. Oh man. Okay. Oh no. Okay, let's see. Adafruit space sensor dot H. Now what line is that on? Line eleven? Yeah, okay. Fatal error adafruit sensor dot H. No sort of follow directory. Where is that line? It's not in the regular includes. Oh, it's in the file of this itself. Okay, well, let's have a look at that. I haven't got a fun thing to look at this with. I usually like to look at stuff in TextMate because this is what I'm most familiar with, but let's just for funsies open this up in cathode. Oh no! Okay, maybe it can't be open with cathode. <laughs> cathode is, if you're wondering, a an alternative to the standard terminal that just skins it to look like an old school uh, an old school terminal. <laughs> so in line number twenty six, three twenty one. Let's see. Okay, this guy. So I guess it depends on this other library that we have to have. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Oh, cathode launched. Anyway, this is what it looks like, but you can skin it with other ones. Ooh. So now we go and look for the Adafruit sensor library. This is not going to be the most efficient way to find it. Okay. Here we go. This is probably something I should just have anyway. Oh. Back to Finder. Back to the Git thing. Copying and pasting libraries. Fantastic. The nice thing about this is that I have all the Git repos, so anytime one updates, uh, if it's out of date, I can just go and update it with Git. It'll be fine. Let's give this another shot. Restart Arduino. <laughs> this is why I'm more of a, a hardware person than a software person. And I keep saying this, it's kind of boring, but it's because of dependency trees, that's why. Oh no, but I do have Adafruit censor.h. I do, it's right there. It's even spelled the same way this time, dang. What's the problem? Hmm. It should definitely know how to look in there. But you know what? We've got five minutes left. So I'm gonna. Hmm. No, but it'd be so good to get this working. We've got six minutes left. It's a challenge. Let me make sure that the screen share is still working. Yep, that's there all right. Okay, back to where we know. In file included from inertial keyboard test. Yeah. Adafruit sensor not H. There is no such file directory, but there is. Okay, let's Google this. Oh no, not you. Arduino can find library. Oh, you know what? Yeah, so there's a couple of quick sort of hacky fixes that we can do for this. 
One thing we can do is include library. Oh, maybe it's, huh, I don't see why that would be called something else. Oh, maybe it's because it's not included in the sketch. No, that doesn't make sense. So we'll try it anyway. Okay, well that fixed that error. The other thing I was going to try doing is just, yeah, pulling the library folder itself into the sketch folder for this sketch, which has been created. But let's see, itg3200.h is also not working. Mm. Indeed, it is not in there. So wait, let's see. No, it's not in there. Okay, we'll go get it. ITG3200. So basically, the only problem is that um, they're using these sensors for which you need to have libraries to read from them. However, they don't necessarily have those included in the um, in the Git repo. Possibly for size, possibly because it's sort of expected that you'll have it. So what is this? Oh, that's the gyro. Cool. Let's see. Looks like this is a good place to look. Cool. Yeah, let's go grab that. It's an I2C development library. Cool. Nice. Now here's the question though, is it the same one? It's probably not the same one. They're probably using a different library so it might interface differently. So let's make sure that we get that one exactly. Oh yeah, free IMU. Oh, it's another thing by Paul, our friend, the creator of Teensy. Fantastic. Um, now I was gonna, See, it seems to me that it should be part of the free IMU library then. So it puzzles me that it's not finding it. You know, I would sort of expect it to be in here. But I guess they need, hmm. I guess it's still a separate library. So we're gonna copy this. <laughs> oh, it's a bizarre thing. I wonder if I'll be able to open this. Yeah. Oh. Your brain's going. Gotta have breakfast. I would rather stay a couple extra minutes with y'all and uh, finish this than, than give up. We are minutes from our goal. Plus dependency errors, you know? They just annoy me. We did get our big green button working though. I'm excited about that. <laughs> The cool thing is that, you know, once you've made, built a keyboard with one of those thing, these things, it'll be understood natively as a keyboard by your computer. So like this Mac, I can type in any application using this ridiculous binary thing I made, you know? I can type in notes. The idea originally was to be able to make notes while I'm sort of waking up without fully waking up. So I don't have to look at anything. I barely have to move. I only have to use one hand. Um, and I'd be able to make some sort of garbled notes about whatever dreams I just had. So, <laughs> here's the same game again. Okay, got a binder. Ugh. One thing, when the library, and it's going to be here. Yep. Okay. Throw it in with the rest of our libraries. And you know what it looks like, actually? Oh. Let's go back to the sketch, actually. I guess this free IMU folder has a lot of the stuff that we needed. So I'm going to actually remove that. Where do we know? So I'm going to guess that we'll probably get one of those other 
library errors, and we'll just have to stick that in as well. So let's see. I'm going to open the original and make sure that that's what I was referencing. Examples. Um, here was the original sketch that we're modifying. Oh, uh, no, it was looking for that library. OK, <laughs> I shouldn't have removed that. Whoops, go back. I thought it wouldn't necessarily make sense to have two co like two different libraries for the same sensor in here, but it's always good to, oh, stop it. No, I'm trying to copy this. Uh, stop that, okay. We'll just option drag it, whatever. There we go. So let's just have a look. BMA 180, do I have that? Nope. Where do we know? Libraries folder. Okay, got that over here. Let's just copy all of these over. And if there's repeats, that's okay. Because these may be newer versions of them. And again, I probably should have. Let's just re get pull it again. Oops. Well, we'll fix that later. Okay, let's see. Or we can copy them and paste them back. No. It's being super weird here. At any rate, Arduino should now be able to find all of those things. So let's try uploading this. Oh, error compiling. Spider edge. We should have that. Serial programming interface, I believe it stands for. But we don't. So let's go find it. Now, really, I should just look at all of these. Let's see, wire.h, math.h. I think those are both sort of standard. I know it's in the I2, I squared C development library. And that's probably referenced by another library. Okay. Well, no, it's this one. So this one is complaining because we don't have spy.h. After this, the good news is we're going to have every library ever. Spy. I should just go ahead and download all of these after this show. Yes, I would like to download it, please. It says it's included in the Arduino software, so it's surprising to me. It's not there. Yeah, it says it's included in the Arduino. What's your problem? Spy.h new such file or directory. Well, hmm. Here we go. Oh, hey. Look, it's our friend's code vendor. They make a pretty cool uh, utility that lets you write Arduino in your browser and then flash it to your board just for, like right from there, which means that you can see someone's Arduino code example on in your browser and load it onto your board just by plugging it in and clicking download. Kind of like if you've worked with the particle photon or the spark core, same idea. 
So we're gonna go ahead and clone this guy. <laughs> Dependency hell. Let's go find this. What the web click ever? What's it called? Click on the library files. There we go. Spy. Oh, look. Fantastic. These are all really basic libraries. I'm really surprised that we didn't just have Spy available. It's possible that it's an issue with the sketch finding itself. Option. Option drag. Happens now. No, it is just an issue with it finding it. What's your problem? I'm going to. I guess these orange ones might be ones that are by default included, perhaps. But either way, it's right there. And it's called spy.h. So I'm tempted to say something. Oh, no, we found too many. Great. Hmm. Oh, but now it's complaining about a different thing. That's OK. As long, I'd rather have you be able to find more things and not err around on that anymore than to keep giving me that stupid error. Let's see. MPU6050.h. I would expect that to have been among the free IME ones, but I guess it's not. Oh, wait. Oh, 60x0. Hmm, maybe that's an updated version. I wonder when this sketch is from. And it looks like that was in our I squared C development library download. I don't find it in our GitHub folder. Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay, cool. This is um, uh, a model made by our friends at TI. But where in this repository? Going back to Arduino. Okay. Oh, wow, cool. Here we go. Cross your fingers for me. Hmm. Eprom the age. That should be easy. But no. Hmm. What was the other one that we were just looking at that included a bunch of different ones? Hmm. This one, I think. It is in there. Fantastic. We don't have to download anything else. Maybe I'll just. No, that'll get us some repeats, and we don't want that. I thought about just copying all of these over there. But then, if there's some that repeat default installed library, we might get more errors. And I'm all about fewer errors. Oh no, you can't find it again. What is your problem? It is called that, right? Ebron. 
dot h. Man, you're having troubles. What if I just go and say, wait a minute, where are you looking? Oh, this is my sketches, okay. Can I just do that? Nope. Well, rather than keep broadcasting me sort of plowing through dependency hell, I will sign off. Um, it's 12.41, and I'll see you next Tuesday at 11.30 a.m. Pacific. You can find the whole schedule at tinyurl.com slash hackstertv, all one world. Um, also next Tuesday night uh, on the 29th. Let me show you my face again. <clears throat> next Tuesday night on the 29th at Geekdom, which is the place of our secret mountain volcano lair. It is, it is in a volcano. I promise, but you'll have to come to find out. It's in San Francisco, our near second and Folsom. At 6.30, we'll be you know, giving you tasty snacks and starting up. At 7.30, everyone will do a show and tell, and then we'll just hack for the rest of the night. You're welcome to come next Tuesday, the 29th. That's also on the Hackster TV schedule. And uh, I'll see you next week. <laughs>